my message today is friends. Friends spelled F-R-I-E-N-D-S. What is a friend? Now Webster's will give you a meaning that doesn't fully exemplify what a friend is. The word can tell you really what a friend is, but I'm going to give you Webster's Dictionary of a Friend. A person whom one knows and with whom one has a bond of mutual affection, typically exclusive of sexual and family relations. When they say that, they're saying, you don't have any family ties with a friend, okay? He's not a part of your family. He's not your brother or your sister, cousin or nephew or uncle or that such. And also exclusive of sexual issues. In other words, you're not having a relationship with that individual or that person is not your go-to person for those particular needs. So erase those things, put them out the way, and then think of that individual as someone foreign from that particular area of family member or a sexual partner. They say that if you know a friend or if you have a friend, the word gives us a basic meaning for what that friend is supposed to be. But today I'm going to give you information on real friendship, on what friendship means, what friendship is really about, what a friend really is, a friend that stands beside you, a friend that's closer than a brother. Right. I'm going to give you that today, or closer than a sister. But in order to give you that, I've got to give you some background, and I've been told that I'm the great storyteller, but I have to give a story to give a meaning, and the meaning will display the complete visual effect for the story. Now, if I start off by telling you, if you know Samuel, all of you will probably say, oh yeah, I know Samuel. I remember Samuel. But in the book of Samuel, he gives you a description of a friendship. Now this friendship is vital. It's important because if you lay a foundation about this particular friendship, then you may be able to base your friendship on it. Now I can base my friendship on that because I can base my friend on that. Basically because I look at this, when I read this story, I look at my friend in the same way that these two individuals looked at friends or these two individuals were friends. Growing up as a young boy, I never had a friend. I, I'll say I had a lot of friends, but I didn't really think they were friends. In other words, they were friends, but they were friends if they could get something, or if they needed me for something, right. or if they could borrow something and not give it back, right. or if they could use something that I had, or vice versa. If I could use what they had, or borrow what I needed from them, then they were friends. So growing up, it's pretty hard to keep friends like that when the only time you can gather that individual is when you got to go get something from them or they got to come and get something from you. Or the mutual friendship that you're calling a friendship is basically a need friendship. I need something from him. I need something from her. So the men may say, well, I've got a lady friend over here. Well, what type of lady friend? What is her purpose in your life? Is she there for the purpose only for the physical attraction? Or is she there for uh, consolation? Or is she there for what need do you have from that particular female individual? Or a male friend. If I have a male friend, then what is his particular purpose in your life? Is it just for those need purposes? The useful purposes? The gathering of objects? Friendship purpose, is that, is that what it's for? If that's what it's for, then that's not really a friend. That's an actuality a, a, acquaintance. Or it's someone that you think you are calling a friend, and it's not really a friendship. It's basically 
eloquent. So uh, uh, I just say uh, just a, a mutual agreement where two people have an agreement, and that's basically going to survive. When I lay this foundation by start off with and start off by saying that in Samuel, everybody knows Saul. And I gotta kind of leave this open because Saul was a king that was given to Israel because Israel was begging for a king. Like we need a king. God, we gotta have a king. Everybody else got a king. We want a king. So give us a king. So they gave Israel Saul. Okay, well Saul was not the king that could be chosen by God. But because they begged for him so much and they wanted a king so bad, they gave Saul to Israel. Well, he wasn't chosen, but he was king. And he ruled for I ruled 42 years, actually. But he still wasn't chosen king. He wasn't the one that God had said, well, we're going to put him in a position. I want him there. Because normally if God puts you in that position, Excuse me for the French, but come in high water, you can't move that man. You can't move him because God set him in that position. So when he sets you there, then you're not going anywhere. You're going to do there and do your turn, and then you're going to do it with integrity. You're going to do it with honor. You may trip and stumble on different occasions because people are going to make you do that, but you're still placed there by God. So anyway, uh, to not make a long story too long, Saul became the king. Well, Saul had a son named Jonathan. And at the time, Samuel, and I'm going to skip over a couple of chapters here, because chapter 12 tells us how, at the last part of chapter 12, it tells you that, uh, that in 12.15, it said, All the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord, and there they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. They got what they wanted. We got Saul, y'all. So we don't be happy for right now. And Samuel said to Israel in chapter 12, verse 1, I have listened to you in all that you have said to me, and I have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you. From my childhood to this day. So they had their king. So Saul ruled. The way he was supposed to rule. But Saul had some issues. And one of the things. That Saul had a problem with. Was probably one of the bigger things. Was pride. Pride is a serious issue for a lot of men. Well women too. But we stumble with that a lot of times. Men you know that well as I do. Because we want to be. Who, we, we're, who we're not sometimes. So pride gets in there. And infiltrates a lot of our emotions and makes us think we're somebody that we're not. But Saul had a son, and his son's name was Jonathan. Now, if you're the son of the king, then this is my thing. If I'm the son of the king and Pastor Cecil's my dad, well, he's ruling, and my thought process is that I'm the prince. So when he moves or he dies, or he, whatever happens, gets senile or whatever, I'm going to step in. I'm going to be the king. So, you know, he got to de decrease so I can increase and become who I'm supposed to be. So once he moves out of the way, it's my turn. I'm getting the rule. I'm the son of the king, so I'm the prince. So, Dad, you got to go. I got to come in. So it's my turn. But Jonathan was a different type of individual. Jonathan, knowing that he was the son of Saul, and at the same time, being the son of Saul and the prince, and soon possibly to be king, he saw things a little differently because there was another player in the game that nobody saw. Well, Samuel saw him, but nobody else got to see this guy. He was in the background, little guy, red hair, reddish face, young teenage kid out there, ten and cheap. He's out there minding his business. His dad's name was Jesse. And what happened was Samuel knew that God had a plan for Israel. But Israel didn't know what their plan was. Well, Samuel knew the plan. 
and he was going to unfold the plan, but first he had to find out who was the main player or who was going to be the main player. The main player was going to be a little guy named David. And David was the type of person that had a whole lot of confidence. This is a funny thing about confidence. People take confidence and they mix that up with being arrogant. And confidence has nothing to do with arrogance. It's an entirely different fold from arrogance. Confidence is something you know that you have that other people see you with it and they're actually jealous because you got it because they don't have it. So confidence stands alone by itself. When someone is confident, they can do things and say things and fulfill things that the normal human being can't do. So confidence stands alone. So this little guy, David, this redhead kid, he's walking around, he's out here in the field, ten and cheap. God gives him the power to actually kill a bear. Ten, he, and he's watching the sheep. And he's talking about a young kid. And I can't really use a teenager here as an example. But we'll take a teenager of about 13 to 17 years old. <laughs> we'll use that teenager right there. That 17 year old. But they, he, he's 17 years older. It's somewhere in the lights. He's a teenager. He gets up and he's protecting his sheep and he takes a lion and tears him up. He takes a bear and tears him up to protect his sheep. This is a young guy. Now he didn't kill a lion. Now, I don't know about y'all, but the last lions I saw had their paws as big as my head. I got a big head. So they got big old paws, big old teeth, claws, the whole nine yards. And he kills the lion. Now a bear Nine times, I think even a small bear weighs more than the average man. So we're talking about a bear. Back then, I gather, I'm gathering these bears are probably anywhere from five to eight feet tall. I say seven to ten feet tall. Let me change that. But David gets out here and destroys by the power of God. And if they leave that up, he destroys these two bears to protect the sheep. So we know right now that David has confidence. And he's going to take care of the business at hand. So David being the keeper of the sheep and the youngest son of Jesse, like I said, a ruddy, confident, bright-eyed shepherd boy, was going to have a claim to fame. But he didn't know it at the time. But Samuel knew it. He had gotten a message. So we go back into the, the, the realm of Jonathan again being the son of or the prince, or the soon-to-be king after Saul walks away or dies or whatever. That process still had to be in Jonathan's mind. But Israel was fighting against the Philistines. And the Philistines were a group of arrogant people too. They were ready to take over and do what they were going to do. They were going to just tell the Israelites, you know, we're going to just squash y'all. And we're going to squash y'all, first of all, because we got one man that will take on the whole shebang. If, if he shows up and shows out, he just going to take y'all out. That one man was about 10 feet tall, big old man, a giant of iron. And a shield bearer went before him. A shield bearer is an individual that actually carries part of his armor. He carries that big old round thing that he holds when he's like fighting with a sword. But he had a shield bearer. This is a big man. This is a big old man. And I'm saying all this to get to a point about a friend. Even though it seems like I've kind of taken a long sidebar, I'm going to bring it all back around for you. So he has armor bearing all these things and uh, he was actually cutting down or chopping up the Israelites. He was saying how they're scared, they're puny, they ain't nothing. The lion can take care of y'all. You know, he, he's our big bad man. He gonna, he gonna take care of all this. What well, David happened to be hearing a little bit of scuttlebutt, as we used to call it, uh, about what Goliath says he's going to do. Well, David's out here tending sheep. But he runs all the way to the lines or the front lines, or whatever you want to call it, where Goliath is doing all this talking. And David, being of confidence, of the confidence that he had, David 
David said, <laughs> who is this big, ugly, uncircumcised Philistine talking about he going to mess with the army of God? What? Are you kidding me? And while he said that, his brother was listening. And this is kind of comical because, okay, this is the big brother, but he's sitting back there with the rest of them scared people. And he's mad because his little brother came in here and showed some confidence. But like I tell you, confidence is a strange thing when you, when you have it. You're not worried about what somebody else says. You don't even hear him, really. So he goes and he tells, he tells the man about this big, ugly, uncircumcised Philistine that's threatening the Israelites, or threatening his people. People that are representing his God. And David knows he serves a mighty God. And if he serves a mighty God, why are these guys sitting back in the back, hiding behind the tents and everything else? Worried about one man. So David goes up front, he goes ahead and does his thing, and he says, hey, I can take care of this guy. I, I can do this. I'm going to skip over some parts because I can't get real deep in that because i got to get to my friend's part. So David gets out here, and he literally goes out, and Saul tries to give him his armor, and David tells him, I, I can't fight with that junk, man. I got to fight the way God set me up to fight. So he takes his stuff that he knew about, his little slingshot, five spool stones, and he goes out there to battle the law. So he had his five stones. He was loaded. He was ready. So what does he do? He goes out and takes this big, ugly, uncircumcised Philistine, knocks him upside the head with one of his best stones. He probably said, yeah, this got the last name on it. I'm going to take him out with them right here. I ain't going to need these other folks. I'm going to take him this. This got a big G on it. We're going to put this G upside his head. He whipped it and whipped it and whipped it. What they had to do? Clocked your boy upside the head. That may have just knocked him out. It may have just kind of dazed him. But guess what? It dazed him long enough for David to walk up there and take his own sword and take that head. Take the head off. Took that big sword, took his head off. Of course, he goes back, and they carry the head into Saul. Now, this is where the friendship comes in. Jonathan, knowing that he was a prince, knowing that he very well could have been the next one in line for the job, he saw David, and he brought that head in. What do you think it did to Jonathan when he saw David come in as a champion with that head in his hand? Well, actually, someone else was carrying the head. David had to carry the head. He had to get no blood on him. Bring the head in and tell Saul, Saul. Here's the head, the life. Jonathan saw that. When Jonathan saw that, listen to this. In 18, chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, it says, When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own life. Saul took David that day and would not let him return to his father's house. But that's not important. What's important is what Jonathan did. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own life. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor, even his sword. Now, back in those days, your sword was like our sword. It's what we care. It's what we need. It's what we got to have. So in essence, Jonathan gave David even his sword. So if he thought that much to give David his sword, and then a friend is someone that when you step outside the box a little bit, he comes and he puts you back in the box. Or he puts you back in perspective. Or he puts you back where you need to be. A friend is someone that's going to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable when you think you're comfortable. When you get too comfortable in the area, and you're going too far to the left, 
He's the guy that's going to pull you back to the right. right. A friend is an individual that when you're in pain, he's going to help you with that pain. He's going to make it a lot less painful. A friend is a person that a lot of times when someone else won't tell you the truth about what's going on, he's going to tell you the truth even though it hurts. When you get so far out of line that you think you're doing right and the right is wrong, he's going to correct the right. He's going to make it right. A friend carries a lot of weight if you have a true friend. They're going to come in and do things that nobody else can do. They're going to say things that probably nobody else can say and convince you that it needs to be done. When you have total confidence in an individual that stands by your side and you trust them, you believe in them, and they show you the path that you're going to take, and then you see the path unfolding, 